Chapter 13 Jake sat at the payphone by the front windows chatting with Cody St. Germain. He called his childhood friend in Chicago to let him know he and Oliver were coming to visit him. Cody was surprised Jake took in a foster son. He didn't think he had the patience for kids, but live and learn. He heard of stranger things. Cody was in his office checking his ending stock price on the internet. He owned a small computer software company named after him. He was as brilliant as Dr. McAllister, one of his idols, but was by no means as big as Microsoft. He was a millionaire. He maintained a penthouse in the city, but spent weekends at his cabin. It wasn't far from Joliet on the Illinois River. With Christmas so close, he planned to stay there through the holidays. He gave Jake the address for his GPS and said he and Oliver were welcome to spend Christmas with him. I wish you would get a cell phone, Jake, Cody said. There's so much happening. Texting would be the best way to keep in contact. I have one, Jake replied. Yes, but only for business, right? Agency only. So, I can't text you? I get you, buddy, Jake replied, but I don't want to carry around two phones. What's wrong with social media? Cody sighed. It's so slow. If you could put an app on that phone, no can do. Against the regulations. You see the problem, right? Cody asked. I have to wait for you to log into your laptop. He brought his cell phone closer to his mouth. I've waited two days for a reply before. Jake relented. Okay, okay. I'll look into getting one. You'll do no such thing, Cody exclaimed. The only thing you're going to do is look into your Christmas stocking. Got me a phone? Think I'm going to tell you? I'm glad you're not going home this year, Jake said, tucking his notepad with the directions into his shirt pocket. Cody said, I'm sending my mother to Hawaii through New Year's. I'm swamped here. It'll be a working vacation for me. I'll bet, Jake replied, a note of sarcasm in his voice. You... He paused, interrupted by yelling. The voice was so loud, he could hear it over the diner's patronage. They could, too. Conversation stopped. Everyone turned their attention toward the parking lot. Jake told Cody to hold on. He leaned over, peered out the window, and saw three menacing youths shoving Oliver through the side door. Jake thought, I hope Oliver doesn't hurt them too badly. Cody, he asked, watching the dining room tables empty. Everyone moved to the windows to watch the spectacle. I have to go. We'll be there the day after tomorrow, okay? The day before Christmas Eve? Cody asked. I'll definitely be at the cabin. Call me if you get lost. Sure, buddy, Jake said. When pigs fly. Jake hung up and sauntered over to the windows with the rest of the rubberneckers. Daisy filed in next to him, nervously insisting that he do something. Jake shook his head. Don't worry, Daisy, he said. Just watch. Daisy stared at him like he was out of his mind. Oliver stood in the parking lot with his hands at the ready. Robbie and the other two boys circled him. He crouched low, prepared to defend himself if they were foolish enough to attack. All this over a video game, Oliver thought. He could scarcely believe it. He sensed the patron's apprehension behind him in the diner. No doubt they assumed, due to his size... He was about to be seriously hurt. There was an anxiousness in the air, too. They were looking forward to the spectacle. It was primal, instinctive, and it touched Oliver's in ways he would have rather it didn't. Master Lynn taught him an animal lived inside everyone. The object was to control the animal, not let the animal control you. The scents coming from the people in the diner were feeding his animal. Taking Robbie and his friends apart would be child's play. Oliver sincerely hoped none of them ended up dead. Robbie feigned an attack. Oliver moved with him, not fooled at all. He knew he wasn't going to strike. His scent was all wrong. Oliver also sensed that the other two boys weren't going to do anything until Robbie did. Their dance continued. Inside the diner, Daisy's paranoia grew. I'll call the police, she said, her concern for Oliver's safety overflowing. Jake caught her arm as she moved, but barely. He had to reach over two other people and stretch to do it. 
Don't bother, he said, his tone serious. Call an ambulance, Daisy. Your boys are going to need one. Daisy opened her mouth to respond. Then she looked into his eyes. There was something in them that told her he wasn't kidding. She headed to her office in the back room. When she got to the phone, she called the ambulance first, and then called the police. Jake leaned against the window. Come on, Oliver. You don't have all night for this crap. Oliver looked over and flashed him an OK sign. Jake stood bolt upright. You can hear me? Oliver nodded. Oh, my God, Jake gasped. Robbie, taking advantage of Oliver's apparent distraction, dove at him from behind. Oliver felt the rush of air from his movement. He stepped to the side, out of the way. Robbie sprawled forward, face down on the dirt. He jumped to his feet and whirled around, his eyes raging. Stand still and fight, you pussy! Robbie spat, his face flushed scarlet. He dove next, arms flailing. Oliver caught one of them and slipped under it. He lifted his foot and brought it down on the back of Robbie's knee. Oliver slammed him into the dirt flat on his back. He followed the move with a quick punch to his jaw. He was so fast, it was a blur to everyone watching. The small boy tried to hit him from behind. Oliver caught his fist without even turning around. He pivoted on his left foot and front kicked him in the chest and then in the chin. At the same time, he twisted his wrist. The small boy flipped over through the air like a pinwheel. Oliver deposited him on the ground next to Robbie. He hit the dirt twice as hard, knocking the wind out of him. Oliver let him go. Christian grabbed him from behind in a bear hug. He strained to lift Oliver off the ground, but gasped when he didn't have the strength. Oliver was too heavy. The wolf boy flexed and broke free. He thrust back an elbow, striking Christian in the side. He spun around and hit him with a tirade of punches to the abdomen, chest, and finished with an elbow uppercut. Christian lifted a foot into the air. He was unconscious before he hit the ground. Yeah, a man inside the diner cried. He was a hefty biker with food stuck in his beard. Hit him like that again! He turned to his buddies. Cecil! Donnie, look at this kid go! Jake smiled. Oliver turned to see the small boy running away. A wise choice, he thought. Robbie struggled to his feet, shifting from side to side. Oliver was about to ask him to stand down when he heard a click. Robbie had a switchblade. He held it out. Come on, he cried, spitting blood. His lips split down the middle. I suggest you put the knife down, Oliver warned his eyes narrowing. He felt something inside, something savage. It crawled into his mind, thick and inky. He didn't realize it, but he was growling. Robbie lunged, knife first. Oliver grabbed him by the wrist, one-handed. He squeezed hard, forcing Robbie down to one knee. He leaned into him, baring his teeth and growling louder. The color ran out of Robbie's cheeks when he looked into Oliver's eyes. They were glowing with a dim purple light. Oliver smelled Robbie's fear. He felt a tidal wave of loathing wash over him. He was drowning in an irresistible desire to hurt Robbie badly. So Oliver did. With a flick of his wrist, Oliver broke Robbie's arm with a loud snap. Robbie screamed, but Oliver didn't stop. He punched him in the chest, breaking some of his ribs. He hit him in the solar plexus, in the face, all the while holding Robbie's broken arm. He threw a back fist, hearing the bones in his cheeks shatter. Robbie fell to his knees, barely conscious. Oliver gripped a handful of his hair and prepared to deal the death blow. But he paused, crooking his head to the side. The sound of sirens in the distance brought him back to his senses. He dropped Robbie on the ground. He heard the crowd inside the diner cheering, applauding. Oliver looked for Jake. He was in the doorway, slipping Daisy a $50 bill. 
He ran over and put his arm across Oliver's shoulders, leading him toward the truck. Jake cried, That was incredible! It was? Oliver asked, looking up. He thought Jake might be angry with him. I think I hurt that boy. Screw him, Jake said. He's lucky he didn't kill him when he pulled that blade. I would have. He would have? Oliver asked. Well, Jake replied, maybe not, but I would have heard him. Oliver was about to say something, but they reached the truck. He climbed into the passenger seat. Jake fired up the engine and pulled out of the lot. He smiled at Oliver, shaking his head. Oliver lowered his. He felt uneasy about what just happened. If Robbie were less durable, he would have killed him. That didn't sit well with him. But then, he was trained to kill, wasn't he? He was agency and had sanction authority. It would have been simple. Those boys appeared to be moving in slow motion. He could have beat ten such boys easily. It was the hunger he felt that bothered him, the black feeling of calm in the pit of his stomach that burned anticipation. Jake asked, Are you okay, buddy? Two Kansas state troopers in an ambulance got off the highway on the westbound side. Jake entered on the eastbound side, quickly building up speed. He reached over and gripped Oliver's shoulder. What is it? What's wrong? Oliver's gaze was a million miles away. I'm not sure, he softly replied. When that boy, Robbie, pulled that knife? He looked at Jake fearfully. All he wanted to do was taste his blood.